I know everyone's a little curious about the subject. Did the Israeli military kill its own citizens on October 7th and the days afterward? Can all of the 1,200 deaths be laid at Hamas's door? Well, most people appear to be reluctant to look into it. After all, looking into friendly fire incidents on October 7th can make people targets for slander and misrepresentation. They can easily be described as conspiracy theorists and the like. One of the very few, if not the only outlet that has continuously covered the topic, is the Electronic Intifada. By merely updating its readership on the known facts of friendly fire incidents over the course of October 7th and afterward, they have been targeted with at least one attack article from the Washington Post, where they were lumped in with right-wing Holocaust deniers, saying they exaggerated claims. Obviously, the Electronic Intifada weren't phased by it and continued reporting. So relying off of their work and the work of others as well, I've created a little bit of a timeline of the reports of friendly fire incidents on October 7th and afterward, in order to lay out simply what we know so far. This is inconclusive, and I've already waited for some time to make a video on it since I wanted some time to pass for more information to be known. We don't know how many of the 1,200 deaths can be attributed to Israel or Hamas, but we can't attribute all of them to Hamas. Indeed, the Hamas killed 1,200 Israelis line, which has been a key justification for the ongoing genocide and deliberately induced famine in Gaza, can be shown to be demonstrably false. Let's get started. One of the first reports of friendly fire on October 7th came just days later, on October 15th, in the Israeli Yedio Aharonot. Excerpts from the article, written by Yoav Zaitun, went viral on Twitter, including the following. After the pilots realized that, it was very difficult to distinguish between terrorists and Israeli soldiers or civilians, the decision was made that the first objective of the fighter helicopters is to stop the deluge of terrorists. 28 fighter helicopters shot, over the course of the day, all of the ammunition in their bellies. We are talking about hundreds of 30mm cannon mortars and Hellfire missiles. The frequency of fire at the thousands of terrorists was enormous at the start, and only at a certain point did the pilots begin to slow their attacks and carefully choose the targets. According to the Air Force, in the first four hours of the start of the battles, helicopters and fighter craft attacked about 300 targets, most in Israeli territory. As early as October 20th, Nir Hassan writes for Haaretz about an incident at the kibbutz Be'eri. Hassan spoke with a resident named Tuval Eskapum, and according to him, only on Monday night, and only after the commanders in the field made difficult decisions, including shelling houses with all their occupants inside in order to eliminate the terrorists along with the hostages, did the IDF complete the takeover of the kibbutz. The price was terrible. At least 112 Ba'eri people were killed. Others were kidnapped. Yesterday, 11 days after the massacre, the bodies of a mother and her son were discovered in one of the destroyed houses. It is believed that more bodies are still lying in the rubble. Another witness, Israeli Lieutenant Colonel Salman Habaka, spoke to the Guardian's Peter Beaumont on November 2nd. I arrived in Ba'eri to see Brigadier General Barak Hiram, and the first thing he asked me is to fire a shell into a house where Hamas was sheltering. The first question that comes to your mind is, are there hostages there? We did all the preliminary checks before we decided to fire a shell into a house, and then we went from house to house to free the hostages. And that's how the fighting was until the evening in the kibbutz and in the streets. The New York Times would go on to provide a revealing quote from the commander of Israeli forces at Kibbutz Be'eri, the aforementioned Brigadier General Barak Hiram. The Israeli commander who led the fight detailed how he had authorized tank fire to end what was already an hours-long standoff, even at the cost of civilian casualties. Another survivor of the Kibbutz Be'eri incident, a Yasmin Porat, provided her testimony to radio host Arya Golan for his program This Morning, hosted on the state radio station Khan 
which subsequently went viral. <laughs> The electronic intifada attributes this ruthless response from Israeli commanders to the Hannibal Directive a protocol that allows Israeli forces to use overwhelming force to kill one of their own captured soldiers rather than allow them to be taken prisoner. The rationale for the Hannibal Directive is to avoid allowing an enemy to have captives that can be used in prisoner exchange negotiations. The next month, on November 16th, in an interview with Israeli diplomat and advisor Mark Regev on the Mehdi Hassan Show, Regev provides a revealing admission. We originally said in the atrocious uh, uh, Hamas attack on our people on October 7th, we had the number at 1,400 casualties. And now we've revised that down to 1,200 because we understood that we had overestimated. We, we made a mistake. There were actually bodies that were so badly burnt, we thought they were ours. In the end, apparently, they were uh, Hamas terrorists. Electronic Intifada editor-in-chief Ali Abunima observed, it simply makes no sense that 200 bodies burned beyond recognition that Israel thought were Israeli civilians could turn out to be Hamas fighters unless Israel killed people indiscriminately. Just two days later, Haaretz published an article by Josh Breiner about how Hamas didn't have prior knowledge of the Nova Music Festival. One sentence in particular reveals, apparently, the first direct official Israeli acknowledgement of Israeli friendly fire on October 7th and afterward. According to a police source, the investigation also indicates that an IDF combat helicopter that arrived to the scene and fired at terrorists there apparently also hit some festival participants. December 5th, Reservist Colonel Nof Eretz is featured on the Haaretz podcast The Week. משם הגיעו כנראה גם השמועות שהצבא הפציץ כל מיני בתים בתוך היישובים, גם נוהל קניבל, כל מיני תיאוריות קונספירציה שרצו בימים הראשונים. לא הפציצו בתים ללא אישור, גם פקודת חניבל שמדברים עליה היא פקודה של לעצור חטיפה של רכב בודד, נכתבה על בסיס חטיפות שנעשו בלבנון כבר לפני 30 שנה. האם למזכר או לכטמ"ם ש... מזהה את הרכב, האם הוא יפתח באש על הרכב עצמו כדי לעצור את החטיפה הזאת בכל מחיר? כמובן, גם במחיר של פגיעה בחטוף. וזה קרה פעם? נוהל חניבל כנראה הופעל באיזשהו שלב, כי ברגע שהבינו שיש חטיפה, אז הם מיד אומרים, חבר'ה, זה, זה חניבל. פה זה היה חניבל המוני. זה היה משימה בלתי אפשרית לזהות ולעשות מה שעשו. December 12th comes another shocking admission from the Israeli army, reported in the Israeli Yedia Aharonat. Casualties fell as a result of friendly fire on October 7th, but the IDF believes that beyond the operational investigations of the events, it would not be morally sound to investigate these incidents due to the immense and complex quantity of them that took place in the kibbutzim and southern Israeli communities due to the challenging situations the soldiers were in at the time. This policy of just simply refusing to investigate friendly fire incidents might also explain a bizarre decision by the state of Israel to bury hundreds of cars with ashes and bloodstains, as reported by the Jerusalem Post. For the first time ever, they will bury entire vehicles. Some of the cars have bloodstains or ashes that are difficult to collect for various technical reasons that have to do with the way these individuals were killed. In order to save space and be as environmentally friendly as possible, the cars may be shredded before being buried. The underlying rationale behind this initiative is to maximize space efficiency by compacting the existing vehicles. A major expose arrived in the new year on January 12th in Yadu Aharonat, written by Yov Zaiton and Ronan Bergman, who report that what happened on October 7th and afterward constituted a long series of failures, mishaps, and chaos in the army. The article is worth quoting at length. 
the IDF decided to apply a directive similar to the Hannibal Directive, in the course of which they also shot at vehicles that may have been carrying captives. This is the question at the heart of the investigation. Where was the Israel Defense Force in the first hours of the morning of October 7th? In those same hours, some of the hardest, most embarrassing, and infuriating chapters in the history of the army were also written. This includes a command chain that failed almost entirely and was entirely blindsided, and orders to open fire on terrorist vehicles speeding towards Gaza, even as there was a concern that they contained captives, some sort of renewed version of the Hannibal Directive. The officers of the UAV squadron, UAV as an unmanned aerial vehicle, understood that there was no point for them to wait for orders from the Air Force Command or from the Gaza Division. They did manage to get in touch with the division and essentially asked that all procedures, orders, and regulations be tossed in the trash. You have authority to fire at will, the Zeke operators were told by the division, Zeke as in the Albert Hermes 450. In other words, shoot at anything that looks threatening or like an enemy. The officers faced dilemmas of life and death. Where should they direct the helicopter gunships and the Zeke first? To the dozens of breaches in the fence through which the terrorists continue to arrive? To the posts currently occupied by the terrorists, where they were killing hundreds of soldiers and taking others as captives back into Gaza? Or should it be in the direction of Sterot or the Kibbutzim, where the civilians were being brutalized? Eventually, the commanders sent the Apache pilots a command that has never appeared in any standing order. You have permission until further notice and throughout the entire area. Even almost six hours after the fact, the fog covering that status evaluation was immense. This was the moment at which the IDF decided to return to a version of the Hannibal Directives. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for watching. If you want to see a bunch of uncensored and exclusive videos, um, and join my Discord server where we have video calls, uh, weekly lectures, live stream, all kinds of things. Or if you just want to support me in the videos, that's fine too. Go to patreon.com slash GDF official. Be sure to like and subscribe and everything. I have a lot more of this series coming. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for watching. Love you all and take care.